they have a socially intelligent robot, which actually is operating in 25 different hospitals today. Is physical AI the missing piece to make robots truly useful and scalable? Hello and welcome to Tech First. My name is John Kassir, Amazon. And NVIDIA recently announced the Physical AI Partnership or Fellowship with Mass Robotics. The first cohort is pretty exciting. It's got startups working on drone naval ships, robotic construction equipment, robotic hands, which are notoriously difficult, warehouse robots, of course, for logistics, powered exoskeletons so we can go lots of places and have more energy doing it, and farm bots for agriculture, which is a super hot space right now. Here to chat about all of it is Tamar Rashid, Head of Generative AI and Innovation and Delivery at AWS. Welcome, Tamar. Thank you so much, John. I'm really excited to be here to chat with you about the fellowship and all the great stuff that we're doing. Very, very, very cool. Let's kick off right at the beginning, kind of baseline here, set the foundation. What is physical AI? So physical AI is an AI that bases on actual physical understanding. So when you actually look at how AI has progressed over the years, starting sort of with, you know, classic, you know, machine learning and how we've got into cognitive AI, generative AI combined with now agentic AI is really giving inroads into how this could be applied in the physical world, right? And so mm-hmm. when you take AI and how it helps in the digital world, now you can take AI and now bring spatial data into the intelligence. And so physical AI is really effectively saying, how do you use spatial awareness and apply that with intelligence to be able to now have actuation done um, mm-hmm. on physical objects and in physical settings? Yeah, yeah. I was going to bring this up later, but I mean, it's just a perfect segue right now. I mean, obviously, we've seen a massive amount of innovation in digital AI, if I can call it that, on the LLM side, right? And and I guess the question is, how does that fit in with physical AI? Because on the digital side, an LLM can screw up, right? It can give a different answer to the same question to different people, or even to me if I ask on different times, because it's probabilistic, not exactly deterministic. But the world isn't as squishy, right? The real world has people in it or other objects in it that you could hit or trip over, stumble over, those sorts of things. How do LLMs fit into physical AI? So LLMs fit very nicely into the context of physical AI with the added aspect that physical AI actually introduces some new things to consider, right? And let me expand on that a little bit. When you look at sort of the foundational aspects that are transferable from large language models into physical AI models, you have this probabilistic nature that's common in both, right? Mm -hmm. And now when you deal with large language models, there's certainly ways and techniques to make sure that you can control the outputs of a generated model, right? And I think everything goes back to the quality of data. Mm -hmm. The quality of data that you train the model on is going to be a strong function into the accuracy, the factualness of the outputs. Mm-hmm. And you know, mm-hmm. obviously, there's certain ways that in today's model with generative AI, you know, you can control the outputs, right? In physical AI, the most important thing here is to consider safety, right? Because yeah. when you are dealing with robotics or devices that now interact with the physical environment, and for that matter alongside human beings, safety considerations are very, very important, right? And so being able to build physical AI and these robots and any device that's going to be using these physical AI models, it's very important to have that awareness of safety. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that being a first principle um, in physical AI, because if something can cause harm, well, that's a first principle that needs to be addressed you know, within the within the setting of physical AI. And we see that LLMs are super helpful. I mean, figures using them for the humanoid robot so it knows what a tomato is or how to put the, that the dishes go in the dishwasher, that sort of thing, right? There's a lot of world understanding there. And I'm assuming there's a lot that needs to be built on top of that in terms of navigating safely in, in this real world. Maybe contextualize the the challenge for us a little bit. Why is physical AI so important right now? I mean, we, we see humanoid robots, a lot of innovation there. We see delivery bots. Starship just entered. Amazon has 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 flying robots that do some deliveries. We see Waymo on the streets and others like that. Why is physical AI so critical right now? 
Well, physical AI is critical right now because I think if you look at the past decade of innovation that's happened, you know, within machine learning, within artificial intelligence, you know, within advancements that we've had with the Internet of Things, you see this very interesting convergence happening, which makes physical AI so applicable and important to us right now. Customers have already started using generative AI and agentic AI and actually getting the, you know, the dividend back. And and we're still very early days with the ROI that companies are being able to reference. The truth is, is in order for the dividends to pay, this technology has to be adopted at scale. And mm-hmm. you're seeing certain use cases within certain industries where you're starting to see productivity gains. And we see this within healthcare, for example, or within in the insurance industry, where very simple use cases around intelligent document processing are giving 80% efficiency with just the reduction in cycle time, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason physical AI is so important right now because you have so many things that are happening all at the same time. You have, you know, workforce shortages that are being experienced in multiple industries. You have physical labor, which just the changing population of folks that are now going to be getting out of the workforce, it's creating these big gaps over time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other thing to look at it is that there's just a massive opportunity. There's over 2.5 billion people globally that perform physical labor, mm-hmm. representing almost you know 50 trillion worth of annual output that automation and physical AI can help address. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's also a lot of advancements within just the technology. I mean, if you look at components, the price of these components is is falling. Sensors, whether they're cameras, LiDAR technology, or depth technology, the cost of those, the efficiency of those have all sort of improved over time. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually see like, you know, robotics grade processors, for example, offered through companies like NVIDIA, purpose built, you know, training and inferencing technology, which, you know, AWS also offers as well. All these Mm -hmm. things are now coming together and making it a very opportune time for focus on physical AI. Cool. What are some of the biggest problems that need to be solved? I mean, obviously one of the startups, and we'll get into all the startups in a moment, one of the startups is is manipulation, fingers, hands, that's a core challenge. I mean, these are so sensor rich and they're so manipulable, it's amazing. And, And making those in a robotic way is really, really challenging. What do you see as some of the key problems with physical AI that need to be solved? So you see a number of things that need to be addressed across the entire stack, right? And so if you actually look at the models themselves, these physical AI models that need to be created, they have to be trained on a very unique set of data, right? And so, for example, if you actually do look at some of the advancements that we've actually even done at Amazon in the fulfillment centers, just being able to have a sled robot navigate the fulfillment center, you have to have a lot of spatial data. Mm -hmm. And so one of the the first challenges is making sure that you have a very rich data set that is domain specific and has the right spatial information that now you could train a model on top of, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's obviously one thing. The great thing here is, is in order to get that data, you have to instrument it, right? So you've Mm -hmm. already had to have had some level of device instrumentation that's been able to collect that data. And now you can have the right data set to be able to train the model on. So I think that's definitely one aspect that we see and where the innovation center can obviously help out with. The second part is, you just mentioned this, right? Actuation Mm -hmm. is a very broad category for how a device can actually now interact with the physical environment, right? And so I always give this example that if you have generalized models or generalized actuation, which is the action of picking up an item. Now you have fine grain ways of picking certain items, right? So the way you pick up, you know, an orange, for example, is very different with how you would pick up a berry. Mm -hmm. It's very, very fine grained, right? Or for that Mm -hmm. matter, even looking at, you know, surgical robotics, right? There's some tasks which are very generalized, right? And require very, what I like to call coarse grained actuation. Mm-hmm. But then the moment you get into very, very fine-grained surgical maneuvering, now you're talking about 
a very different level of actuation and safety and precision that's required, right? Yeah. yeah. And so being able to solve that in it itself is a very, very big problem statement to go address. It's huge. I mean, these things, we can swing a sledgehammer and a surgeon can cut into an eyeball. I mean, it, it's, it's just the, le- the range in a human hand is insane. And of course, we're not going to replicate that, certainly not in the near future in, in robotic hands or actuators, but being able to get the right technology is, is is pretty critical. Let's talk about that first cohort. I mean, there's some pretty interesting stuff there, right? I mean, very diverse as well. Navigation drone type stuff for naval vessels, a robotic construction equipment, hands is in there, warehouse robots, which is probably near and dear to Amazon's heart as well, powered exoskeletons, farm bots. That's more and more important. There's a huge labor shortage in a lot of places around farming. What, what's got you excited in that cohort? Well, so we have eight startups that are part of the cohort, right? And, you know, it's very unique that you know, these companies are spanning multiple industries, right? They have high compute needs with both physical and edge AI that they're doing. And what's very interesting about it is the need for fine tuning or reinforcement learning and some of these methods to be able to have very efficient intelligence. It's all permeated across all these eight startups that are there. You know, a few that I'd really like to highlight, like, so, you know, Bedrock Robotics is one of them. They're based out of San Francisco and they provide same day hardware and software installation to basically provide autonomy to existing construction equipment, right? Mm. And so they specialize in retrofitting existing construction vehicles with sensors, computing hardware, and AI. And you're effectively converting what are you know conventional excavators and diggers now into autonomous machines. Right? Wow. It's very exciting the work that they're doing there. You know, another one, Diligent Robotics, they're based out of Austin, Texas. And they actually develop foundation models for autonomous humanoid robotics with human-facing environments. Mm. They have a socially intelligent robot, which actually is operating in 25 different hospitals today. Wow. And they just recently got into senior living. And mm-hmm. with the increasing labor shortages, about 18 million direct care workers that are expected to exit the field by 2040, you have this gap that gets created, right? And so now I'm targeting how AI and robots can actually help, you know, senior citizens. There's Mm -hmm. growing demand for that, right? And so this Mm -hmm. is a couple of the examples of the eight companies that are part of the fellowship. They're impressive startups. They're impressive companies, actually. And more so when you told me some of the details there. Talk about generalist versus specialist. I mean, that's kind of the thing in a lot of circles around humanoid robots, right? It can be a generalist and do everything that a human can do. There's a lot of people say, come on, you need a specialist. A dishwasher is a robot and it's very specialized. And and there you go. Where do you sit on that? Are you are you a little agnostic? Are you in one of those camps? Where, where do you fit? You know, to be honest with you, John, I think we're going to need both. And we actually see that today with generative AI and even agentic AI is you have this thing of generalized capabilities, which if you look into the parlance today of generative AI, foundation models capture general tasks. And now there are specialized models that can be fine-tuned on specific data sets to address very specific tasks. And so we see that even with agentic AI, where you have general agents performing kind of generalized tasks, Mm-hmm. But then now specialized agents, which are, you know, fine-tuned on a very specific data set. And the great example of that is what we see in certain industries. So, for example, in the credit card industry, you may use a generalized agent to do a certain task. But then when it comes down to, like, credit card disputes, right, it's a very, very fine-grained activity. And if you could train that on data sets that you've, you know, kind of had for many years... Now you have a specialized agent that can do that special activity, right? Yeah. You're going to see the same thing play out within physical AI too, where there's going to be a set of general kind of physical activities that can be mm-hmm. carried out by, you know, a general purpose robot, for example. But then you're going to have specialized capabilities too, where the need for specialized physical AI is going to be very, very important. And you'll see that in, you know, for the healthcare industry, for example. You might see it within certain aspects of industrial manufacturing, which require that very fine-grained domain-specific activity. 
Yeah. And there's analogies, right? I mean, we have plumbers and we have framers. We have people who drive vehicles and trucks and we have people who move stuff all in the physical world, right? And, and all that happens today. And so we'll probably see a lot of that as we go forward as well. I guess the key question is you've got a, a very nice seat on, on all this innovation. Are we going to see some of that making it to Amazon in the future? Well, you know, we do see a number of those innovations already happening within Amazon. If you look at our fulfillment centers and how we've included a, a variety of automation and robotic automation within the fulfillment centers, we're already seeing 25% efficiency just in kind of the core business of fulfillment. And then other aspects of it, you know, part of our business within AWS. And I think we're going to see this a lot more with customers today. Innovation Center, we are working with a number of industrial manufacturers, several companies in automotive space, where the combination of generative AI, agentic AI, and now physical AI are all sort of coming together. Cool. And so while I do feel like we are still in the very early days of agentic AI, we are even in the earliest days of physical AI. And yeah. that's why, you know, the fellowship is timed very nicely. Um, it brings together, you know, not only what we offer, but then partners like NVIDIA and Mass Robotics. And yes, we've initially targeted you know, startup community and we have these eight startups that are part of cohort one. We actually see us diversifying that over the course, right? And so the 2026, really excited about eventually bringing some enterprise companies into the fellowship. Interesting. Interesting. Not just startups, but some established players. Very, very cool. And just to be clear, because of robotics, you said you're seeing 25% improvements in efficiency already? Yes, already within Amazon. Yeah. So that's logistics and warehousing and all that stuff? Yeah. So when you have, we have automation across logistics, actually, you know, classic machine learning with how we do route optimizations. Mm. At the same time, when you look at the fulfillment centers and the usage of, you know, robots within there, you're seeing already those efficiency gains. And that's a good shout out actually to the software as well as the hardware, right? I mean, you can have the best hardware in the world and the greatest robots in the world, but if all the elements for common orders are, are five kilometers away from each other, <laughs> you're going to have some challenges getting them together and being efficient. But this has been super interesting. Thank you for the time. I really do appreciate it. No, thank you so much, John. It was great chatting with you.